In yesterday's session, I talked about the fact that there's a common way of thinking about morality and what it demands of us. And the, the, that, that way is to think of morality as a matter of compliance with rules, treating it essentially as a matter of duty and obedience, whether to divine commands or social expectations or the promptings of so-called conscience. And objectivism rejects that conception of ethics. According to objectivism, the demands of morality stem not from divine commandments or social expectations or any kind of alleged duties. They're derived from facts about the nature of man and the nature of the world he lives in. And what a morality properly offers is not rules, but guidance for achieving ends. And what I want to do in today's session is to indicate some of the ways in which the guidance that object the objectivist ethics is giving you is coming from an acknowledgement of and a respect for uh, certain key facts about man's nature, certain metaphysical facts facts about what man is, how he operates, what he requires, facts that we need to respect and adhere to if we're to live and function successfully. And the reason I bring this up is because I think the more one comes to see this, the more one can see ethics, and in particular the objectivist ethics, as one's ally, as one's ally in helping one to live, rather than a set of duties to comply with or commands to obey. Now, I said that what the objectivist ethics offers is offers you as guidance. And guidance is advice about how to, uh, it's advice about the means to reach a goal. If I tell you to turn left at the stop sign, is that guidance? Kind of, right? It depends. Uh, it's only guidance if you're trying to get to a specific place. And what I'm trying to do is indicate the means by which you'd get there. So I think the, the, the notion of guidance is dependent on the notion of goal. It implies a goal. Guidance is guidance toward a goal. And what a moral theory should do is help you to think about what goals to pursue and then give you guidance about how to reach those goals. And objectivism has a definite perspective on both, on, on the basic goals or values to pursue and the fundamental means or methods of achieving those goals, namely the virtues that it advocates. I said that what a morality properly offers is guidance in the pursuit of ends or goals. But what generates the need for guidance? Why do we need to pursue ends or goals at all? And the answer is the fact, the metaphysical fact, that life is conditional. In other words, it depends on taking certain specific actions and achieving certain specific kinds of goals. So a value is a goal or end considered from the perspective of its contribution to an organism's life. It's not a special kind of fact. It's a fact evaluated in relation to its contribution to an organism's life. Living things pursue ends because their continued existence requires it. That's the basic fact that sets the context and the need for pursuing goals. It's the metaphysical fact that like any other organism's life. Man's life has definite requirements, and in order to live, in order to remain in existence, he needs to meet those requirements. Moreover, and here's another metaphysical fact. In other words, a fact inherent in the nature of man uh, and the world and so on. Man is not born with the knowledge of what uh, those requirements are or how to meet them. So again, this is, this is a simply, simply a fact. In that case, he faces survival as a problem to be solved. Life is given to him, but survival isn't. He has to discover what his, li his life requires. So essentially what he needs is knowledge. And here we come to another metaphysical fact. Reason is man's basic means of acquiring knowledge and of identifying values. And in that sense, reason is his basic means of survival. We haven't gotten to ethics yet. We haven't gotten to guidance yet. This is just outlining some of the facts that you need to, that, that form the framework uh, for giving guidance. But there are some other important facts to know about reason, about our means of survival. 
First, reason is an attribute of the individual. No one can think for you. Understanding is not something another person's consciousness can achieve for you. Second, reason is volitional. It operates by choice. It doesn't function automatically. You have to choose to engage it and sustain, an, a, sustain a process of thought. Moreover, one must choose to remain in existence. One must choose to embrace life as a value and choose to sustain it on an ongoing basis. Still in the realm of facts. But this is what brings us into the realm of ethics, of moral guidance, and why we would need guidance. If we embrace life, then we have to embrace the means to it. And that's what the objectivist ethics specifies. So we're gonna look, we're gonna look at the virtues, or some of the virtues, from, the, from that perspective. A virtue is a grasp of a fundamental causal relationship. And what they're giving you is guidance in light of the grasp of this fundamental fact, of these metaphysical facts. The advice takes the form of, this is how to live. Given the nature of reality and your nature, this is how you need to act. This is how you need to function. And notice that the virtues, uh, at least in the objectivist ethics, the, the essay, the objectivist ethics, are formulated as the recognition of the fact that. And the fact is an abstract metaphysical fact. So I want to read from this. Not the whole thing. <clears throat> so she says, quote, and again, this is from the perspective of there are metaphysical facts that form the parameters, the frameworks, the basic things you need to think about uh, and, and uh, respect and acknowledge deeply if you're going to think about how you should function in life. So she says, the virtue of rationality means the recognition and acceptance of reason as one's only source of knowledge. Reason is one's only source of knowledge. Fact, something AOC, fact. One's only judge of values and one's only guide to action. It means, one, it means one's total commitment, now this is where we get guidance. It means one's total commitment to a state of full conscious awareness, to the maintenance of a full mental focus in all issues in all choices, in all of one's waking hours. It means a commitment to the fullest perception of reality within one's power and to the constant active expansion of one's perception, i.e. of one's knowledge. It means a commitment to the reality of one's own existence, i.e. to the principle that all of one's goals, values, and actions take place in reality, and therefore that one must never place any value or consideration or whatever above one's perception of reality and so on. So again, it's, if you take the virtue of rationality, your basic means of knowledge, and well, your, a reason is your basic means of knowledge. It's your basic means of identifying what your life requires. Reason is your means of survival. It's your basic survival tool. And so what rationality says, embrace it. In all aspects of your life, in the sense that you don't keep reason on a leash, Reason is how you figure out everything. And this is why evasion she regards as a vice. In other words, deliberately refusing to know, deliberately ignoring facts. It subverts your consciousness. It subverts your means of survival. So, oh, there's a, there's a good quote from Dr. Peikoff. I, I think I'll use. He says, Dr. Le Leonard Peikoff, in his book, uh, Objectivism, the Philosophy of Ayn Rand, he says, quote, to value reason is the opposite, not only of rejecting it, but also of accepting it dutifully. In regard to the mind, the objectivist is not disinterested or grudging. He does not say, I myself would rather be irrational, but since A is A, I agree not to hold contradictions. On the contrary, grasping the vital role of consciousness, he awards reason the fundamental place in his personal value structure. He is the one who cherishes his means of survival, 
who recoils at the prospect of subverting it, so on. Now, some of the other virtues that we get, um, independence, integrity, honesty, are really aspects of rationality. Uh, they're, 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 way, they're specifications about how to be rational. So, independence, he says, she says, continuing the quote from Objectivist Ethics. She says, it means, the, it, 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 meaning rationality, it means the acceptance of the responsibility of forming one's own judgments and living by the work of one's own mind, which is the virtue of independence. It, meaning rationality, it means that one must never sacrifice one's convictions to the opinions or wishes of others, which is the virtue of integrity. Again, that's the guidance. The guidance is, because this is the case, don't sacrifice your convictions to the opinions or wishes of others. Why not? Yeah, okay, that's one aspect, is that it's contrary to your own judgment of the facts, and that only you can do the thinking, only you can arrive at the conclusions. Other people are in the same position. So other people don't have any special power over reality that, that, that you don't. In other words, uh, consciousness is a means of, 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 of attaining knowledge about it. And you have to, and the only one you can operate uh, is your own. He says, uh, let's see here. It also means that one must never attempt to fake reality in any manner, which is the vir virtue of honesty. So rationality is about existences exist, facts are facts, stay fact focused and only fact focused. Um, so what honesty specifies is existence exists and only existence exists. In other words, pretense is a widespread phenomenon. All sorts of kinds of pretense of faking, of rationalization, not being rational, rationalization, you know, coming up with some kind of phony excuse uh, for your motives. Um, it's widespread. Uh, and it's, it's really emphasizing facts are facts, don't fake them, because there's all sorts of ways of faking them to yourself, to others, and so on. But again, going back to another metaphysical fact about the primacy of existence, consciousness doesn't control existence. Your thoughts and opinions don't control what the facts are. So the facts are going to be what they are, no matter whether you ignore them or not. And they kind of sneak up on you when you start ignoring them. Um, and cause a lot of problems. Which are the ones I want to do? So take the virtue of productiveness. She says the virtue, of, sorry to read so much, but this is, this is the issue, this, this is the relationship. The virtue of productiveness is the recognition of the fact that productive work is the process by which man's mind sustains his life. Again, that's the fact, there's a fact. Productive work is the process by which man sustains his life. That's how you get your values. It's the production of material values in support of your life. That's it, that's how you survive. The process, it's the process that sets men free of the necessity to adjust himself to his background as all animals do, and gives him the power to adjust his background to himself. That's a fact. Pride. She says, the virtue, quote, the virtue of pride is the recognition of the fact that, that as man must produce the physical values he needs to sustain his life, so he must acquire the values of character that make life worth sustaining. That as man is a being of self-made self wealth, so he's a being of self-made soul. So, in the, what, so when it comes to the case of, uh, of pride, the metaphysical fact is man is a being of self-made soul, like it or not. So you're the product of your choices, you're the product of your actions. Over time, you built that, so to speak. Um, and you have to take really seriously that what you're building is a life. And part of the issue of, of, of self-esteem, for example, is you have an ongoing, constant awareness of yourself as an actor, as an agent in the world. Um, and self-esteem is a causal perspective on you as an actor in the world. What do you think of that actor? How, how successful is that actor or that agent able to uh, uh, achieve his values? What are his choices like? 
What do they add up to? And in that regard, she thinks of self-esteem as, as a, on the one hand, it's an issue of, of self-confidence and it's an issue of self-worth. Self-confidence is, can I do it? You know, is it true that you've got this? Um, and self-worth is, I built that. You know, I'm worthy of living and so on. But you have to build that. And I think pride in that way is what she characterizes it as moral ambitiousness. It's be ambitious about building yourself into the kind of person that you think, yeah, uh, I'm worth it and I can do it. And that takes work. Um, so this is, just, this is just a way of introducing some of the ways in which um, there's a lot of talk about fact and value and how you can find a relationship between the two. Um, and this is just one of these ways in which to try to point out that there are, there are real facts, I mean, you can challenge the facts, right? <laughs> but there are real facts on which the objective is ethics is based and it's really guidance. And it's one of the reasons why she thinks of it as a science. You're grasping causal relationships. Because of this fact, you should be doing this. Um, so life is about understanding causality and using it to achieve ends. The question is what is causally required to achieve your goals and then enact the causes. And this is why the source, this is what I was stressing in the last session, this is why the source of moral obligation, like you must do this, is not divine mandate or the expectations of society. It's a chosen commitment to identify and put into practice the actions and policies that allow you to achieve your own life and happiness. So that's why I think, I think we really need to move away as much as we can from the idea that morality is a matter of compliance. Uh, it just, I think it, it makes people resentment, uh, resentful of morality. It makes them think that morality is their enemy. And often when they come to objectivism and they say, oh, now I got another set of seven commandments in effect, and they treat it in the sense of, oh, these are just another set of duties. Uh, and it's completely wrong. Um, but this is, the, this is something I've been coming to appreciate more and more over the last couple of months is just that um, the causal perspective, I mean, she, she says this, I mean, causality versus duty in this essay, I mean, she stresses this a lot, but this, the sense in which she, the guidance is causal. It's this leads to that. Because of these facts, you sh if you want to live, <laughs> that's the linchpin, this is what you need to do. And this is why she thinks of morality as a science. It has to, it's an issue of cause and effect. Um, okay, that's all for the prepared remarks. Now, uh, let's go ahead and discuss some of these issues. So, questions? Yes, sir. This is the virtue of selfishness? Uh, yeah. Yes. I've been in conversations with people who bring up sometimes people uh, don't strive for life and so strive so much. I don't have a, a way of really responding to that. Can you talk about this side of yeah, so one of the things they said was that, it, so you, you, if you look at this, a set of facts, reason, I can move away here, yeah. Uh, if you say reason is your means of survival, this is, these are the values your life requires, but in the end, it's why go for that. Like why embrace the choice to live? Um, and in the end, there's no answer outside life in the sense that life is an end in itself. It's where values are. It's where reasons are. So it's, if you don't enter that field, uh, if, you don't, if you don't say that, then there is no motivation. When it comes to, um, now you can tell someone, right, who is in a situation where they're considering suicide. I mean, I'm, this is not my psychological advice. Um, but if, if someone is facing that, the only thing that you can do, I mean, in essence, is to point to the values that are there. And if that doesn't grab someone, it won't grab them. But that's the only thing, there isn't, there isn't you couldn't point to um, a reason or a justification for embracing values in that sense. It's, the, it's where all the, all the justification would be. Because what would you point to? Yeah. Um, so there, is, there, there isn't a philosophical argument to convince them uh, of yes, you must embrace life. You have to point to the values that are available. Um, 
Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, I think when somebody's contemplating suicide, they're not open to rational persuasion about the values of life. I think they need medical professionals. That would probably be the first place. It's like maybe consider some medication. Go to a, go to a professional person. Yeah, I would say so. Two things. One, yes. I mean, if you actually had like you knew somebody who would, because I, I thought this was an abstract question, but if you actually don't do know somebody, yeah, that's a medical question. Um, but I don't. I don't, I don't think it's true that they're not open to it. Depends where they are. I mean, if, if, so, if somebody has completely given up and said, I, in effect, it's not that it's, I don't see any more value to be gained. Uh, and in that sense, if, they, if you can't move them forward, you can't move them forward. But yeah, I think, I mean, the advice that I would give, if I was a real problem, I would say, yeah, give them to a medical professional. The context of the situation, if you are lived a very full life already and you have some disease that makes you in pain all the time that you can't get relief from, it's, you know, maybe it's a rational choice for them, so. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think the, oh, sorry. Yeah, I think the philosophical issue is that, um, so stepping back into objectivism. Objectivism has no rule for that. It's not like, thou shalt live. Again, that's the going back to treating it as a duty. Right? But yeah, but Ayn Rand said on page, it's, it's not that you have a duty to live. You don't have a duty to live. Um, if you want to live, that's what she says, the proper start of ethics is if you want to live, a rational code of morality can, can specify the causal means to get you there. I mean, in very abstract terms. I mean, some, telling somebody independence, integrity, things like that, these are very abstract concepts and they're, they're really about methods of functioning. Um, I mean, integrity. Keep, integrity is about keeping your abstract convictions, your principles, operative in action. It's making your mind work for you. I mean, the whole point is you're a conceptual being. You, 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 have, to, you have to think and act long term. You have complex needs. Uh, you're not just, yeah, you have complex needs and you need theoretical abstract guidance for that, but you need to keep it operative. And to do that, to keep your mind and, and action intact, that's the virtue of integrity, is keeping that kind of soul-body connection or mind-body connection intact. Yes? No. Uh, doesn't your life exist in the life itself and why it's supposed to exist? Does the existence of life in t imply that it's supposed to exist? Yeah, I guess the point of your, your soul and body is Depends what you mean supposed to. Um, so from a religious perspective, you might say, if life exists, that says that life is good. It's supposed to be there because it it's part of God's plan or it's part of the, the, the setup. Um, and so from an objectivist perspective, it's not that life is there so it's supposed to be there. Life is, there is no supposed to. It's just life is a phenomenon. It has definite requirements. Living organisms pursue ends because that's what their life, that, that's what life is. Life is the pursuit of ends to continue the pursuit of ends, to continue the pursuit of ends until the organism can't do it anymore and it dies. Yeah. What ends are you pursuing? What's that? Uh, ends you're pursuing are uh, life's ends. Yes, the way they ought to be, yes. So, so later saying you know, life ought to exist. No, <laughs> but but there's there's I, I we might I think we're talking past each other a little bit. When you say life ought to exist, this sounds like the universe says that it ought to exist. There's some outside force that makes it mandatory. And I'm not saying that, I'm saying that that's not the case, at least from the perspective of objectivism, as I understand it. Um, if you mean that for any given living organism, he ought to pursue life. Well, I think he ought to, <laughs> but all you can do is find that there are values and you have to choose to embrace them. And you don't, if, you don't want, if you don't want to do that, you don't have to, there's no method for living. It's you don't have to do anything and nature takes its course and you die. Um, but let me move on to another question because I we can chat later because I think we might be talking a bit past each other. Bennett. So, um, you know, Ayn Rand bridges the Islet gap, and the presentation you gave today 
I mean, it would never even it would never even come up if people approached approached the morality the way that you can. Yet that that uh, idea persists and, and you know has a long history and everything. Yeah. Yeah, and I remember I read a book um, by uh, an Australian philosopher, John Mackey. And the first sentence of the book is, well, I'm, if I get this a little bit wrong, but it's something like, there are no moral, val there are no moral facts. That's the thesis of this book. And of course, as a young objectivist, oh, no. <laughs> but once you start reading what he's saying, it's like, well, he's right in what he's saying. Because once you start to read a bit about what, what he's putting forward, it's moral facts aren't part of the furniture of the world. They're not just there under a bush. They're not built into the fabric of the world. They're not there for us to see and, and we are enlightened and then we follow them. Um, uh, and it's like, oh, that's, so he means what Ayn Rand calls intrinsic. They're not built into the world. Um, so, so, and this has been a problem because the, the alternatives seem to be, we make them up. Uh, and he gave a good example in the book and he says, you could have objective values. You could have like really, it's like this is, this is definitely the right uh, value to pursue if you had a kind of a standard. So he says, for example, he says, uh, sheep, he was giving an example about sheepdog trials, you know, because the sheep, sheepdogs have to learn to herd the sheep and they have to learn all sorts of like, you know, where to nip at their heels or whatever they need to do. And so as you, when you go to a competition, there are objective standards about what you need to do. I mean, it needs to be able to herd the sheep, it needs to be able to do this, it needs to be able to whatever, and if you have those kind of standards, then yeah, then you can specify, yeah, this is legitimately, this is the best dog, this wasn't very good, and then you could start at building in the values in a non sort of arbitrary or subjective way. But he thinks we don't really have that when it comes to morality. Um, I mean, Rand's view is that life generated, life is the standard by reference to which you evaluate something as a value. So, um, so the, one of the problems has been what are so-called moral facts? And my view is that, and I think in objectivism's view, is that they're not any special kind of fact. They're just any garden variety fact evaluated from the perspective of their positive or uh, uh, beneficial or harmful uh, relationship to human life. So you don't need a special kind of fact out there um, that's somehow mystical or different or it's not, re it's some kind of something kind of spooky, <laughs> it's, no, they're just any old fact. It's a table, it's a chair, it's, it's a book, um, it's a teacher. I mean, anything can be values uh, when evaluated from that perspective. And so I think that's, that, I mean, that's really, I mean, it's maybe, it's not, maybe it's not all of it, but that's the aspect of it. It's, they're not special facts, they're just regular facts evaluated from the perspective of man's life. Um, why evaluate it from the perspective of man's life, though? And, and I think Rand's answer to that is, it's the only perspective from which generates the whole issue of values. In a world of rocks, rivers, and space dust, nothing is good or bad, right or wrong. Those are all things that come in when you have a living organism for whom things matter. They make a difference. There's the, the polarity, it goes, it's either the, the moving toward life and its sustenance or toward, away from it, toward damage, toward death. And it's that kind of a contrast that makes you be able to evaluate the two. Yeah, we, uh, rewinding a few questions, we were discussing suicide and then the decision to, uh, the choice to live. And I, I think that Miss um, Rand goes, you know, the opposite direction to, you know, suicide and choosing to live, to living the very best way we possibly can the highest and the, the best. And these, the objectives, ethics, particularly the virtues, the idea of setting values and the virtues that will lead to the accomplishment of those values so that you can live a great life, not, not suicidal, or just a basic choice. Well, I think I'll live today. Yeah. But I'm going to live great today. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to do great things. And I think in Atlas Shrug, it, it, you know, <laughs> these guys are not just sort of, you know, deciding whether they want to live or not. These guys are going to live the 
greatest way they can be. And I think that's, for me, yeah. is the real power of the objective ethic. It helps that it's true. Yeah. Um, because otherwise it wouldn't work. But it is does is true, does work. And I think that that is a, a, uh, uh, a wonderful inspiration. Yeah, I think that's excellent. I think that's, uh, it's a good point to make. It's not that suicide means you leave completely the world of values. That's not a great idea in most circumstances, right? Because, you know, but the, the step up is, well, don't kill yourself on the one hand. But, but the way, a proper way of looking at this is, no, embracing life means it's really figuring out like, just how rich of a life you can live. Um, and I think this is one of the things that I was in my, on the plane flight down here. I was thinking, uh, like, I, what's the most important thing I got from objectivism? I, I mean, I discovered objectivism when I was about 19. Um, and, and I guess I'd have to say a specification of the goal, of the complete, of the, of the end product, of what it looked, what would it would look like. Um, to live a life that's really inspiring and worth living. And so when you see a Howard Rourke or a, or a Reardon or a Galt or something, it, for me, in the end, it's that. Because in the end, that's what it's for. Like, why do you need knowledge? So you can get values. Why do you need values? So he can live life. Why live life? Because it's great. It's enjoyable. It's to be had. Uh, and in the end, it's about giving a rich specification of what that looks like. Um, and to, and to really formulate a view of what that looks like, I think is difficult to do. Uh, let's go Halali and then. So I also think that for some people, if they don't have that joyful striving for greatness, and there's something in their life that's causing them pain, or they are having a difficult time orienting themselves towards an achievement orientation like that, then probably it's circular, you know, because you said it takes effort. Right, to, to pursue value and to pursue self-esteem. So if you don't have that or you don't see the point of it, you can probably get into that circle of what's the point of any of it. And probably why people seek God or you know, religion is to give them something that they don't have to effortfully pursue. You just have to. Yeah, and that's one of the aspects of, or that's one of the aspects of the, their metaphysical facts that it has to be earned and there isn't a shortcut. And it takes work and that, if that's life, and it, it, it's a hard fact, but facts are hard, and it's, but the flip side of that is it's enormously rewarding, and it can be also, I mean, I think one of the things about uh, when people are really struggling, whether it's a depression or self-esteem issues, is, is that it's deflating in, in, in terms of action, uh, and the more deflating it is and the less action one takes, again, it's that self-esteem loop. It's what choice am I making? What am I doing? And if it's not much, then it's like, how, what do I think of myself? Not much. And, you know, and so you know, often, and sometimes it's the pull yourself up from your bootstraps, <laughs> and that sometimes it's people really need help. Um, um, but uh, this is one of the things also that getting back to, I mean, one of, the, one of the reasons why metaphysical facts are important is not just that they provide the foundation or the basis for the guidance, like you need them for justificatory purposes. Not, I mean, you do, but they're useful to go back to and remind yourself of. Uh, and I, I wrote an article recently uh, on the philosophy of Stoicism, it's an ancient Greek philosophical school. And this is one of the things that they're really good at. And they said, you know, you need to keep your philosophy at your hip like your sword. It's for use, it's a tool. Uh, and they're constantly reminding themselves now, usually reminding themselves about wrong ideas, but nonetheless, what they're doing is, I need to keep bringing those facts back into perspective so that I remind myself of that. You know, so in, the, in, in some of these cases, it's that happiness requires action. Achievement requires action. You have to keep bringing those things back and like, okay, so I'm not doing anything. So I, would, I, I can't expect achievement. I can't expect to get out. Um, and it's constantly reminding me, no, it's me that made those choices. It's, I have to make those choices. Like, there's no way of getting around that. And to remind yourself of that and reorient, like, am I doing that? Like, how am I functioning now? Um, okay, so maybe things weren't so good in the past, but am I being rational now in the moment? Am I really focused on, like, am I trying to formulate a view as to what it is I want? 
what kind of steps? I mean, it's a focus on causality. Uh, it's what kind of steps would I need to move forward? Um, and so it's helpful to keep reminding oneself of those kind of things as, as, as uh, I mean, for guidance, yeah. I think one of the uh, criticisms of you know, capitalism and selfishness is that individuals will just resort to force to achieve their goals. Well, I wouldn't quite put it as, so, so the question was, uh, why not use force to achieve your ends? And that was a common you know, criticism of, of objectivism. If you're, gonna, if you're gonna be selfish, why not just trample others? I wouldn't quite put it as, uh, uh, as prohibitions, but about um, establishing methods of functioning and principles for your own functioning that allow you to live your life successfully and in, and in a social setting that is uh, uh, conducive to life. And I think living like that puts you at odds. I mean, there are other things to say about it, but the one thing, if you're talking about just like, you know, uh, reaching values and in, uh, living in a society in which you can function safely, conducively with other people, trade and so on, you need to treat them uh, appropriately. I mean, you need to respect their rights just as, as, uh, um, as you want your own rights to be respected. So in other words, there's a, um, you know, on the one hand, there's a reciprocity involved. It's like, what makes my life the best is, one, is that when I'm living in a society in which my rights are, respect, are respected, in which my freedom is respected, in which my mind is respected, in which I can pursue uh, my own rational goals unmolested. Uh, and, and for this very same reason, if you, if you like, for me, like, well, why would that be? Why do I have rights? The argument is the exact same for why any other person has rights. The argument is a universal argument. Um, so I think in, in, terms of, in terms of reason, in terms of logic, in terms of the argument, uh, everyone else can make the exact same case. And so, I mean, partly it's why be rational in the end is what it boils down to. But also, um, it's the wolf among men principle. I mean, in the way, it's not exactly a principle, but it's... It, similarly with the trader principle, why trade with people? Why not just grab their stuff? Try it. I mean, in the, I mean, it's because it, it, to some extent, um, to some extent, these things can start to become unreal questions because if you really took it seriously and you actually tried to think, I don't mean your question is unreal, but I mean it can devolve into just being like a philosophical kind of thing in the sense of to airy, you know. Um, but if you concretize what it would look like, I don't think you'd think, yeah, that, that, yeah that's in my interest. Uh, so a lot of it is about, and this is why the novels are so good, is like really how, to have a kind of a rich concretization of what it looks like to live like that. Um, there's more to say on that issue, but yeah. I saw a hand back up. Um, I guess it was you, Amy. Um, so I, I'm getting a lot of um, we're seeing a lot of people talking about the future of capitalism and the evil. Yeah, um, but I'd like to ask you more about elaborating. How do you monitor yourself in everyday life in terms of applying virtues to your actions? And do you have anything else to say about <clears throat> virtues outside of the sub virtues that were lying up top in the Okay, one is about monitoring yourself and tracking how well you're applying the virtues in your life, and the other one is about what about other virtues? Um, tracking and monitoring. I mean, I think the basic, the basic point is you need to have a view, and this isn't always easy to do, uh, you need to have a view about what it is you want to achieve in life and what are the means to getting there. And I mean, the virtues are useless if they're not means of getting there. And this, I mean, they're tools. They're well. They're, they're principles that, you know, that give you guidance on how to properly function. Um, and, I mean, you could ask yourself on, on, on each of those things, like how, how well am I measuring up? I mean, if you just take rationality or something like that. Um, one, one aspect of it is that, am I really taking my, I mean, first take the negative, sorry, for the negative. am I taking my troubles seriously? And whatever, if I'm having, you know, problems at work, relationship problems, I mean, uh, career stagnation, you know, whatever it is, am I taking a, an active approach to that? Am I trying to actually think, what are the causes? Why is it that I'm, it feels like I'm, I'm not going anywhere? Uh, why does it feel like, 
I feel emotionally flat. Like I'm not, don't, I don't feel pleasure in life very much. It's like things like that. So why, what is that? And taking introspection seriously. That just means looking at the facts seriously. But taking that seriously, and you can ask yourself that. Um, when it comes to productiveness, again, this is not a duty. And it's so hard to hammer that out. But it's, it's related to what do I want to achieve? Because the goal isn't like, how do I increase my productivity? I mean, there are, there are questions like that right now. How do I increase my output if that's, you know, you're in a line of work where that's the kind of thing? But, in, I mean, in my line of work, how much am I learning? How much am I growing? Where am I this year as opposed to last year? Am I better at understanding objectivism? Am I better at communicating the ideas to other people? Is my teaching improving? Do I care? Because if you don't, you kind of to step back and think, well, what are your goals? And if you do care, and you take that seriously, you think, okay, so, but am I, am I being ambitious enough about it? I don't mean you go home and it's 4 a.m., you're just doing everything, but it's, am I being ambitious about thinking about, like, where do I want to grow? Where do I want to expand? And it's not about having your duty to be productive, otherwise you'll feel guilty. It's, you won't attain your goals. You won't attain the goals that you want to achieve. And so it's, I think, keeping a real... Uh, firm focus on what it is you want to achieve and are you doing everything that you can to get there um, or are you in some way be, maybe being too passive or, or, or something um, so that's that and the virtues outside of, object, uh, outside of the seven that Ayn Rand mentions in Galt's speech <sighs> do you have one in mind? something that you would think of as a virtue? Oh, courage. Um, do I have anything special to say about courage? I don't know that I have anything specific to say. What, what brings up the context? Because I, I, I... I'm just curious what to say. <laughs> uh, no, I, I have nothing specific to say now. Courage is something that I think that, you know, about... It's, it's something that is um, it's moral ambitiousness applied specifically to people who are uh, perhaps overthinkers. Perhaps they, they are they're not really. Um, they need a special push to go to action. And about acting and engaging. Doesn't necessarily have to yep. refer to that in terms of integrity to holding firm no matter what obstacles you have, you do it. Yeah, yes, she does. And I think it also relates to self-esteem uh, in the sense that having the, as you say, the courage of your convictions. I mean, it's a little metaphorical, but it's, it's you, you know that something is right. And that is so important to you. And I think it's where self-esteem is so important to you that despite odds, you're going to assert it, you're going to make sure you stand up for it and fight it, it even when, and because courage is in the context of fear. Uh, you don't need courage to, I don't need courage to walk to the back of the room and get a glass of water, right? Um, you might need courage to give a public talk, right? Because it's always in the context of there's an obstacle or a potential obstacle or a foreseeable obstacle to the achievement of one of your values. And you don't just sit down. Uh, you, don't let, uh, you don't let the obstacles or the uh, negatives, in effect, stand in the way of your goals. And that's the way I think it's fundamentally related to self-esteem. You want it, and it's important to you. And I know it's scary, and you're going to do it. You know, um, it's a really important one. Um, because if you don't enact what you need to enact to achieve your goals, um, you get in that negative self-esteem loop because you're not actually taking the actions that you need and you're looking at yourself as an actor in the world and you're not really doing anything. You know, and then you just get more skits go here and then back. Yeah, I just want to follow up on that. I, I, I think the primary method for monitoring and tracking your happiness is through goal setting. Because that gives you a concrete step towards what you think is going to make you happy. So I would say goal setting and kind of all of Edwin Locke's conversation around goal setting would be kind of the answer to that tracking and monitoring. In terms of the other virtues, I, I would say any principle would be kind of like a subset of a virtue. So it could be positive self-talk statements or a heuristic or a rule of thumb or an expert script or some kind of a principle. 
So, for example, um, it's something that you say to remind yourself about the way that you want to live your life. Like you could say, for example, a self-talk statement would be, I choose my words and thoughts carefully. That's not the same thing as a virtue, because it's not as high level as a virtue, but it's still kind of a, a guide to action and kind of like a halfway step between, well, I've got these seven virtues, but they're all pretty abstract and I'm not sure how to apply them in my day-to-day -day life and every little specific incident. But, but you can have these other things that kind of are like more intermediate things, like, um, you know, when, when, when someone's talking to me, I turn off the noise in my head and I pay full attention. That's kind of like a principle or a heuristic or an expert script. Or so Again, it's not the same thing as a virtue. Or another one I use is, I can't change the wind, but I can adjust my sails. Yeah, there are, there are a lot of these different kinds of things which are, in effect, um, uh, reminders of what you want to do and how to behave in certain circumstances to achieve something, uh, to achieve a, a particular goal. And those things can take very abstract, the form of very abstract guidance. You know, have your primary focus on facts, not on other people's opinions. That's, I mean, that's, it covers a wide range of things. But on the other hand, it's, yeah, but on, on the other hand, at work, I mean, I have to pay attention to what my boss thinks of me, and they have to like, well, so that's stepping outside the principle a little bit. But you can have more concrete forms of guidance that aren't so as, as abstract as the virtues, um, as they're formulated. Yeah. Is that kind of what you were looking for in terms of, like, since besides the primary seven virtues, some kind of other heuristics to live by that's kind of a little less abstract. Yeah, and this is what some of the things, that, going back to that Stoicism article, is a lot of the people are popularizing uh, these things that kind of the Tim Ferriss, the Ryan Holidays of the world and so on. And um, while I'm, I'm critical of Stoicism, it doesn't mean you can't you derive values. I mean, you could have, I mean, Holiday wrote this book called, the, what was it called, the, the Daily Stoic. And he's basically got 365, like one little meditation for each day, right? And so he's got a quote from some Stoic philosopher. And then he you know, kind of divides or formulates some kind of form of guidance from it, like modern wisdom you can get from it. I mean, it's a mixed bag. I mean, some of it's good, some of it's bad. But it's like, you know, they, a lot of their times they're helpful reminders about things that are important to keep in mind um, and useful perspective. And some of it isn't, but it's, I, in my view. But it's, yeah, you, I think that's helpful to need. It's a, so it's a way of fleshing out in concrete form in a much more concrete form, some kinds of little rules or reminders or tips, and the hacks, whatever you call them. Um, but the hacks are, I mean, hacks are useful, you know, but not so much outside the context of an operating system. I mean, you, you need a philosophy to be able to integrate these kinds of things into some useful framework. Uh, the, but the tips are important. Yeah. And let me, I keep skipping your accidentally. Sorry. Uh, <clears throat> sorry. Uh, I have a question on maybe the history of philosophy. Uh, the, 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 the article you quoted from, that was a major eye-opener for me, you know, the bridging the is-all gap. I thought it was, well, once you know it, 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 is, it is irresistibly right. And, and, and I always wonder, how could a, a philosopher like Aristotle, for instance, because his, his philosophy was so, I don't know how to say, maybe, maybe life-centered is maybe the, 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 the best word to say. How? how? Uh, how could he miss that point? Or, or would, you, would you agree uh, with what Ayn Rand said, that her philosophy could not have been discovered before the Industrial Revolution? Is, is that a, is, do you think that's, that's a valid point? And, uh, yeah. Well, well, two things. Um, one, about Aristotle. I haven't really thought too much about that particular point. Um, but on the one hand, it's possible that he would have taken something like that rather for granted, oh. but I don't know if that's, the, if that's true. Um, the other possibility is um, the issue as a problem didn't come up. So in, in, like in, in some sense, to me, the whole um, egoism versus altruism is not really something that Aristotle faced in the sense that there are no altruists. It, I mean, all of the Greek ethics, I mean, in, 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 in fundamental terms, it's how to achieve the best life for yourself. Like, what's the best life and how to achieve it? And it was a, you know, and so it's, they weren't battling against uh, a view that says self-sacrifice. I mean, you, you can find things in Plato and stuff, but I mean, the way he formulates it is, yeah, because it's best for you because of what you are and so on. Uh, when it comes to the Industrial Revolution issue, I mean, I think you'd have to take Ayn Rand at her word, in the in just in the sense that she's no, I don't think I would have been able to grasp. Um, the, I mean, I mean, what does the Industrial Revolution show? It, 
I mean, one of the fundamental principles of objectivism, that reason is man's means of survival. I mean, if that's wrong, the objectivist ethics is wrong. So, it's, uh, so reason is man's means of survival. And, and you could really get, like Aristotle got, the height of what man is capable of is a height of reason. And the best life is the most excellent, thoroughgoing uh, life of reason. And that means a life of science, understanding, and just, the, the, I don't know if I can do anything with this stuff. But just to know, on a deep level, to see through things and to be able just to understand the way things work, there's no better life. And, and, and so the, the, the reason why he thinks, well, reason is, is not your practical faculty so much. I mean, I guess it's a view about practical thinking, but um, that it's a theoretical, it's a contemplative uh, thing. And what the Industrial Revolution showed her, I mean, her, in her view, was how the most abstract theoretical reasoning that the mind is capable of is capable of revolutionizing human survival. Like taking it from here to there in all aspects of human life on an astronomical scale. And that's what really hit home. It's not just reason is your, your most let's say, elevated faculty or you can know a lot of stuff. You, it's about survival. It's about life. Um, I mean, yeah. I agree with you completely. But for instance, you know, the, 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 the Greeks were like an island surrounded by barbarians and, and, and they knew about architecture and all of that. Why, why? Isn't it possible that, for instance, Aristotle could have made a jump? Hey, look, we live in these amazing buildings and, and, and the Germanic tribes are, you know, they live in the woods. You know, this, this shows, you know, we figured this out, architecture. It's, that is what reason yeah. can do. And, you know, he could have, couldn't even make, well, it's, it's, it's completely hypothetical, of course. You know? Yes, <laughs> but, but on the other hand, it's like, I mean, you can only ask so much of Mr. A. Uh, <laughs> one can only integrate so much, but uh, I don't know the order. I'll pick you because I I've, I've never seen you before. <laughs> this reminds me of a passage from Atlas Shrugged that I struggled to fully understand. Uh, it was toward the end of the book where the, you know the country was really up on a hill and Daphne was thinking about her brother and the villains and she was asking herself, what's the matter with these people? Don't they want a better economy? Don't they want to build the country up? Don't they want to live? And I've always thought, what does she mean? Like, what's the I, I, I don't think the villains really wanted to die, but what did she mean by that passage? Don't they want to live? And, uh, There's a reason why it took Dagny the entire book to figure that out. I think it's, a, it's, it's one of Rand's deeper insights that I think is hard to grasp. And I think there's a reason why the whole thing is dramatized in the book that it's, it's she can't get it. Uh, and it, it, like, it, it's not real to her. They, they have to want to live in some way. Maybe they want to live uh, uh, by looting Hank Reardon or something, but they want to live, right? Um, and uh, this is a question I would need to like think more about to give you a better answer uh, to on this. Um, and I, I'm, I was going to say that. Uh, are you going to discuss that one? Because so Ben is going to be talking uh, on the last two days of this uh, on specifically on Atlas Shrugged, and you see it's going to be bringing up that scene. And I would guess also uh, on the Atlas project, in one of the sessions, I'm sure that must have come up. Um, and also, uh, for more on that, um, uh, Dr. Ankar Gatte has a, a course on ARI campus called um, A Study of Galt Speech. And that issue is discussed there. Um, that would give you a better answer than I would give you off the cuff. Um, but I think a lot of what, what she's coming to grasp, what Ayn Rand is coming to grasp, and what comes uh, in Atlas Shrugged is, that there really is an issue of you're on the side of life or you're on the side of death in the end. And that ultimately what it means that life is conditional is certain courses of actions and methods of functioning are on the track that lead toward death in the end. De death, damage, non-life. 
and certain other uh, courses of actions and choices are leading toward life and that there's a really a fundamental divide with people. And it really means something to want to choose to live. It means to embrace the kind of methods of functioning that are really on the side of life. And parasitism is not, evasion is not, and you want to start populating these things. All of these things are movements toward damage and death. And there's a sense in which they're actually not embracing life. They're not embracing the causal requirements for life. Do they even think about it? Do they think? You know, and it, the deeper that she gets into grasping this thing, it's, that's when she thinks they actually don't want to live. That that's the full meaning of what their mode of living is like. Okay, so I do have something to say. Um, someone in the... Yeah, gentleman, yeah, back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I'm not sure what the moral skeptic would say about this, but I'm thinking that um, this Aristotelian thing about uh, like the causal analysis, virtues, uh, I don't know, I've a lot of ideas, so I'm going to kind of jumble them. So That's okay. Like, it, so, so take Aristotle's view that uh, the excellences of character, they promote well-being and flourishing, right? So this is a kind of moral fact. Um, and what if you said something like, like, like different species have what the um, animal rights people will say, species typical function. So this kind of animal flourishes in this kind of environment, so we shouldn't put it in that kind of pursuit. And then human beings are a certain kind of being. So it's a kind of fact that we flourish under certain circumstances. Right? And then those of us who cultivate all the virtues, we experience happiness uh, as opposed to suffering. Right? So those are kind of moral facts um, in a way, right? It's like, well. Yeah, they are. So it's the connection between facts and guidance. So the idea is, um, it is true that uh, there are certain things in which um, what you don't get, coming back to this, what you don't get in Aristotle is the sense that reason is man's means of survival. He does there's a way in which it kind of comes across a bit and when he talks about their method of function, like plants function this way, animals function by perception, human beings, but it's not so much, you don't get the sense that they survive by reason. They're perfected by the use of their rationality. They have a capacity which no other uh, being has, his view, and it's like re the full realization of that. He thinks, and, he, and he's right about this, the full realization of that is the, the full realization of, of your humanity. But it's not the, that's how you survive. And you don't really so much get that perspective in Aristotle, and that's what you start to get uh, in Ayn Rand, but then you get it in spades. So, actually, we're, we're out of time now, so thanks a lot for asking questions and stuff. Thanks for watching. To help keep content like this free, consider supporting ARI by becoming a member at aynrand.org forward slash membership.